Go ahead and be seated. And please open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is where we'll be this morning. If you don't have a Bible, uh, then we'd love to put one in your hand. And if I could just get a couple guys uh, to take these Bibles, Jackson, you want or Joe, thank you. And just raise your hand if you don't have a Bible uh, with you. We'll pass these out to you if you need one. We'll be in Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 22. And just follow along as I read. Either those pages that I'm hearing is people still turning or are the kids opening up. <laughs> that is. Follow along. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God, raising him, raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence for he is at my right hand so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover my flesh also will live in hope because you will not abandon my soul to Hades nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew I had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. In our day, you can be almost anything you want to be. We live in a time where individual the individual person is their own authority. It's like the book of Judges. Every man does what is right in his own eyes. But not only do we, does everyone like to do whatever they perceive as right, but others are supposed to agree with whatever each person calls their reality. We live in a Speak your truth, cancel your dissenters, choose your gender, shout down your opponents, type age. Every man is an authority to himself, or so he thinks. Anyone can be anything they want to be. This mindset is applauded in our generation. <clears throat> 
But even at a time, and perhaps especially at a time like the one we currently live in, when this kind of subjectivity rules, the one thing that you absolutely cannot be is certain. You may not be certain. Certainly not. You cannot be certain that God, the creator and sovereign ruler of all creation, has spoken, that he has spoken clearly, that you understand and obey what he has clearly said, and that, like you, all men must also bow the knee to that God and creator, that we are all obligated to obey him. If you are certain of these things, then you are immediately labeled arrogant, a bigot, intolerant, unloving. But there really are no more truths that are more self-evident than those, that God is God, we are not, he has spoken, and he is worthy of our obedience. And so men who love the darkness rather than the light, who prefer their sin as opposed to God's standard of holiness, these men despise being confronted with a clear authoritative word from God. As one church historian said, nothing terrifies the defenders of human traditions so much as the word of God. Did you notice what Peter called his audience to in Acts 2.36 that we just read? That last verse? Look at what he's urging his audience to do. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain. The apostle Peter is calling these Jews gathered in Jerusalem on Pentecost to certainty, a certain knowledge of truth. Specifically, the truth that he has in mind is that God has made this same Jesus whom they crucified, two things, Lord and Christ. God has done this. And he calls them to be certain about these things, the, this fact. This is the, in context, the first post-resurrection evangelism that we have recorded for us in the scriptures this is a call according to verse 38, if we just keep reading, to repent and be baptized. It's a call to the forgiveness of sins, to receive the Holy Spirit who makes witnesses out of rebels. And even according to verse 40, down a little further, Peter continues with many other words. That means he added words to what we've already read solemnly testifying and exhorting them to do this, be saved from this perverse generation, to be saved. So taken together, God's salvation requires knowing for certain. In other words, saving knowledge is certain knowledge about what God has done in Christ Jesus. Saving knowledge is certain knowledge. No one who believes God in the gospel and what he has accomplished on behalf of sinners and crucifying his son in their place, raising him up again, thinks to themselves, but I could be wrong. To be wrong, to even leave open the door of possibility to be wrong, means that God would be a liar, in your opinion. And if you're a Christian, you just don't believe that. You know that God is faithful. You love that God is faithful. And so in this passage today, what we get to see is this saving knowledge, this certain knowledge that God has made Jesus Lord and Christ. And Peter, using three lines of evidence, exhorts Israel to embrace this truth. With three lines of evidence, Peter 
we're going to see in this passage, exhorts Israel to embrace this truth. This is saving faith, to embrace this truth that Jesus is the Christ, Lord and Christ, all by God's design, is synonymous with saving faith. To be certain of that is synonymous with saving faith. And anyone who here today who has yet to embrace Christ as Lord, to embrace Jesus as God's Messiah, to change your mind, to repent of something less than certainty in this reality, and to, for the first time, embrace Jesus as these things, as Lord in Christ, you too can be saved, will be saved from this perverse generation. These three lines of evidence are simple, laid out for us in this way, God's proof, God's purpose, and God's power. Those are the three lines of evidence that the Apostle Peter pursues as he preaches the gospel to these murderous Jewish rebels gathered to feign worship. First, God's proof is detailed for us in verse 22. Men of Israel listen to these words. He's got everyone's attention already because of the various language, languages that are being spoken by Peter and the other 11. And yet, he wants them again to listen up. This is not the first time that he said this. Back in verse 14, he calls them to give heed to his words. And here again, listen to these words. And here is his message. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This is God's proof. Uh, the person God proved is in view first, Jesus the Nazarene. He's got a name. He's associated with his hometown, Nazareth. And even Peter reminds them that he has a similar nature as them. Although he is more than this, he is not less than a man. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man. He was attested to you. This is your proven word. He was proven, displayed publicly to be recognized for who he is. And this was done by God. So not only the person that God proved, but the way God proved what he did about his son. He did this, notice, with three things, miracles and wonders and signs. There, were, there was no shortage of evidence for people who were in the vicinity of Christ, who heard about Christ, to entrust themselves to him. They had abundant reason for trusting Jesus trusting his message, trusting his word, trusting his testimony about what he said about God. Miracles, wonders, signs, a compiling of words here to say things that aren't normal, that demonstrate the veracity of everything that this man is speaking were abundantly available to the people who saw Jesus and heard Jesus. And this is how God proved that his son was who he claimed to be. Do you remember what Nicodemus said when he came to Jesus in John 3? We know you've come from God. You're a teacher, come from God. Because no one can do the things that you're doing. No one could perform the signs that you're doing unless God was with him. Hebrews 2 verifies the same thing, that even... Shortly after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, these same signs continued through the apostles as further verification that the one for whom they spoke, the one Jesus that sent them, that they proclaimed, was indeed who he claimed to be. 
And so this is, in fact, God's proof. And just notice, finally, the the place God proved these things. It was in your midst. They know these things. In your midst. It was in the middle of the people. Crowd after crowd gathered around Jesus to be healed, to even be the beneficiaries of his miracles, signs, wonders. And they were continually amazed by the things that he did. This was, in fact, God's proof that his son was who he said he was. That's the first line of evidence that Peter wants to remind them of. He says, just as you yourselves know. No new information here. You know these things. The second line of evidence is similar. It's God's purpose. God's purpose in these these things that took place. He says, that same Jesus who I'm talking about, Delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you did this. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. So here you have the terminology capturing God's intent, capturing God's purpose, and you have the events that God himself intended. Just notice the terminology, two two really terms that together describe intentional consideration, a wise pursuit of a plan. This Jesus was delivered over by a plan, a predetermined plan and knowledge, knowledge that came before. So this was a previous plan and previous knowledge. It was all God's plan and knowledge. And really those, those terms capture that God was thoughtfully pursuing his end. Jesus was not delivered over by happenstance. It was not an accident. It was not plan B. This was always what God intended. God sent his son for this very purpose. Jesus makes that abundantly clear in his ministry. It is my food to do the will of my father, he would say. My hour has not come, he would say at times. And then later, my hour has come. Glorify the Son. And so this was predetermined by God. It was foreknown by God. And of course it was, because it was his plan. And what was that plan? What did God know that he eventually in time brought about? Peter mentions a few things. Jesus' condemnation, Jesus' crucifixion, and Jesus' death. His condemnation is in view first. He was delivered over. He was given over. He was offered up. He was handed over, is the idea. An innocent man doomed by sinful, biased, hypocritical judgment to be crucified, and he says, you did it. Indicting the Jews present, just gathered shortly after these events, and he says, you, y'all, nailed to a cross this man, and you did it by the means of godless men. So the Jews needing the Romans to accomplish crucifixion, ultimately fulfilling Psalm 22, this is what they did. They condemned him. They crucified him. He says, you nailed to a cross. And eventually that crucifixion resulted in what Peter says put him to death. The Jews are guilty of all these things. (laughs) This is not a mystery to Peter. It's not a mystery to the Jews. They own it later on in verse 37. They're pierced. They receive the indictment and recognize that this is true, what Peter is saying of them. They did indeed crucify this man, Jesus. Now, these first two lines of evidence are similar in that they are both reminders. Again, just notice in verse 22, just as you yourselves know, and then in verse 23, 
He says, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men. You put him to death. So these are all things that the Jews know by experience. And then, in just, after just two short verses of these first two lines of evidence, he spends the remainder of his sermon telling them something they don't know, telling them something they haven't realized yet, but he gives them something of a hook to hang this new information on, all found in the Old Testament. This third line of evidence is God's power. God's power. God's power was definitively seen in the event of Christ's resurrection. Verse 24, but God, but God. He lays out for them what they have done their guilt in crucifying Jesus and putting him to death and seeking to exterminate his life. In verse 24, there is a contrast from what the sinful men did by the hands of godless men, the Jews by the hands of the Romans, and what God did. God, but God raised him up. You see there... God and the Jews, God and the Gentiles are completely at odds with one another. It seemed that the whole world was gathered against God's Christ. Just look at Acts chapter 4. The apostles, this is consistently their message. Acts 4, verse 27. For truly, they said, in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. Two Gentile rulers the Gentiles generally, and Israel. That's everybody. The whole world united against Christ is the way that they saw this rightly. But God, God did something else, raised him up. He did something following Christ's death, raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. So God's power was exercised contrary to sinners, specifically in the same number of ways that the sinners oppose God. The sinners oppose God in Jesus' condemnation, crucifixion, and in Jesus' death. God opposed these sinners by raising Jesus up, by ending death's pains, and by loosing death's hold. In every way that sinners oppose God, God opposes these sinful men. Where they have death in view, he has resurrection in view. Where they have a permanent end, God has a temporary end in view. And just note the power of God to overcome the most unstoppable force to be reckoned with, death itself. That's power. When death proves impotent, then you're looking at omnipotence, all might, all power available at his disposal. God owns that power. God is the single sole arbiter of that kind of power. Without a filial attachment to this God, if you can't call God your father, then you have no access to this power. And death, if you remain in that state, will eventually have its way with you. 
and eternally so. Those who know God as Father, know Christ as Savior, they are like Christ, freed from the sting of death. This says it was impossible for Christ, impossible for Jesus to be held in death's power. And then what he goes on to do, like a master theologian and astute preacher is string together a number of Old Testament concepts and passages that just prove this one point, that God raised Jesus from the dead. He could not remain in the tomb. And there are several evidences that he goes on to unfold for us that prove this point. So God's power, specifically in the resurrection, was prophesied previously in Scripture. First, this prophecy comes from Psalm number 16. For David says of him, this is of Jesus, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Here you have one sufferer exercising confidence in God, in prayer. Now, the, the two ways that you could take this is either the sufferer is David crying out to God or the sufferer is Christ speaking to God and David is writing of these things. And I think that second position is the proper one the best reading of this, so that all of the first-person pronouns, the I, the me, the my's in this passage are actually David writing Christ's words, writing words for Jesus. These would have been words that Jesus would have known, recited in his suffering moments, and these would have been useful to him to strengthen him in those dying moments as he exercised unshakable faith in his God. That view, that point is further made, especially in verses 27 in uh, in those two lines. You will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay, The my soul is the same holy one spoken of in the next line. And let me just show you this back in Psalm 16. Just keep your place in Acts 2. Flip over to Psalm 16. This is equally clear, I believe, from the Old Testament, if read carefully. This is what Eric read for us this morning in our scripture reading. As he articulates, explains God's power, not known to the Jews gathered there, that this power was prophesied previously in scripture, just note how what Peter is driving home, wanting to to emphasize the resurrection but on the heels of Christ's death is actually the same context that we find in Psalm 16. So this is a perfect passage for Peter to plant himself in. A mictum of David, preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. Keep me, guard me, protect me, watch over me. This cry for preservation sets the the context for us to know that the speaker of these words is under fatal circumstances. 
he is under, finds himself in a life-threatening situation. This is why the request is to be preserved. Just notice, too, his confidence, the confident faith of this one. Verses 1, 2, 5, 6, 7, and on. I mean, they, they capture the confidence that this one, I take refuge in you. That's a statement of confidence. You are my Lord. I have no good besides you. Another statement of confidence. What about verse 5? Yahweh is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. This would have been a statement made by priests that they had Yahweh as their portion, as their inheritance, because they did not get land for their inheritance. Those who were of the tribe of Levi, all the other tribes got a portion, got an inheritance, except the Levites. So this one, the Levites, this one is speaking as a priest, which Jesus is. David was not a priest, not of the tribe of Levi. But then he says in verse 6, the lines, the boundaries have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. So like the people, this one also has land promised to him, inheritance given to him. I think that this is just for another parallel. I know I've got, a, got it flipping quite a bit. Psalm 2 tells us even the extent, the extremities of the boundaries that this one gets in Psalm 2 verse 8. God welcomes his king, his anointed one. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends, the extremities of the earth, as your possession. This one has limitless authority. God gives all things into the hands of this one in view, this anointed one. But Psalm 16 helps prove the point about the resurrection because Peter goes to this context where the speaker finds himself in a life-threatening situation His life is on the line, but he's confident in the Lord, even what the Lord will do in the future, and chooses not to indict the Lord, but to bless the Lord, verse 7 of Psalm 16. To bless the Lord. He exalts, verse 9, speaks praises of God, and he's confident that his flesh will dwell securely. Why? Because, verse 10, you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. This is the point that Peter's making. Where does this confidence come from Jesus? Where did the confidence come from Christ that he would dwell securely, even though he would taste death? Well, because he knew he would not be abandoned. He knew that his body would not undergo decay. And there you have two things in view, his life, his soul, the inner self, and even his body, the flesh. So internal self, external self, these things would not be left by God. The one who clinged in trust to God would have God cling to him. And so his body would not even undergo decay. This is an implication for the third day resurrection The Jews, when they made meat, offered a sacrifice, that meat was good the day they sacrificed it, the next day and the day after. I'm not making a case for doing that today, leaving meat out and eating it on the third day, but the decay would have been considered beyond that, any amount of time beyond that. And so if this Holy One would not undergo decay, then the resurrection would have to take place by not the day that he died or the day after, but the following day. 
the third day. Back in Acts 2, this is the exact point that, they, that, well, yeah, David and Peter are driving at. So here you have Peter, Luke quoting Peter, quoting David, quoting Christ in one passage. How's that? All maintaining the same meaning from the time it was penned, what David meant at the very first. And Peter is pointing out in this sermon that these are the very things that happened to Christ. Jesus said these things. He was the one who set the Lord intentionally and always in his presence. This is a way of recording a past action that's continuous, repeated, prolonged. This was Jesus' unerring way of always living, walking in a Fear of the Lord. He is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. And this is why he experiences joy, why he can exalt, why he has this unshakable hope. He knows, verse 27, he will not be abandoned to the grave or Hades, and even his flesh wouldn't undergo decay. In fact, furthermore, indeed, you could say, God made known to this one, to Jesus, the ways of life, not death. Life is what he had in mind for this one. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Peter, at this point in verse 29, feels the need to just state the obvious. I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Clearly, David, in Peter's mind, is not the one who spoke these words. It was another. David did undergo decay. And so this makes the point. Because he was a prophet, verse 30, and knew that God, here's your other Old Testament reference, had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, Then David, he says, looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. So not only does Peter have Psalm 16 in mind, but he also has the Davidic covenant from 2 Samuel 7, Psalm 89, and Psalm 132 in mind. These all passages fixating on the same reality that God would seat a descendant of David on David's throne forever. There would be no end to his kingdom. Solomon, you'll remember, inherited the kingdom. He sat on David's throne, which was always in Jerusalem, by the way. But Solomon died. And then his foolish son, Rehoboam, inherited the kingdom. And then that kingdom was divided And the descendants of David have not been able to see a united kingdom again. And so this one who would rule over a united Jewish people, the seed of David with an unending kingdom, this is still outstanding. All of the biblical promises from Genesis 3 forward that this coming seed would deal with the serpent. His heel would be bruised, but he would be the one to crush Satan's head. All the way forward, through Abraham, who had land promises, and descendants who would inherit that land that he was promised, that same seed who would bless the nations, through whom the nations would be blessed. All of these require what Peter's fixating on in the resurrection. You can't have a seed with a bruised heel who deals with sin, 
who finds himself in the situation described in Psalm 16 and 22, forsaken by God, in need of his life to be preserved, but eventually inheriting a kingdom? How does any of that happen, the fulfillment of all of those promises, through this single seed, single individual, apart from a resurrection? He either deals with sin and dies and is no more, or he doesn't deal with sin and he lives. But Scripture prophesied both. Death and an everlasting kingdom. Death and life forevermore. And so the resurrection is absolutely necessary. What they know so far in these first two lines of evidence don't matter apart from a resurrection. To know that Jesus performed signs and wonders and miracles is insufficient. To know that he did that and that he was crucified for sinners is also insufficient if he remained in the grave. And it's the same for us. To just know those things, to know the facts, those historical facts is insufficient. Peter, in detailing the resurrection, is pushing all the way for what we already read in verse 36, that the house of Israel in this case, and by implication, all of us, would know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, Jesus, the same one who was crucified. That is a saving knowledge. To acknowledge him as Lord and agree with God on what he is, on the determination that God has made concerning his son, that is saving faith. To know the facts of history Unbelievers know those things. The unbelieving Jews knew those things. And yet they still found themselves lost in sin, in need of repentance, baptism, forgiveness, salvation. I'm just burdened at that consideration for the children in the room. Like you, I grew up hearing these truths never disagreed with them as far as I can remember, as far as I can tell. The facts of Jesus' resurrection, the fact of Jesus' death, those were all self-evident to me because I agreed with what my parents taught me. They were faithful to explain those things like your parents are faithful, many of you to explain those things, children. And yet that is not enough to save you. Do you agree with God on who Jesus is? Lord and Christ. This is a way of saying that phrase, both Lord and Christ. Essentially what the Old Testament anticipated in this coming one, that he would be God's king. This is another way of saying that he is Lord and Christ. Is another way of saying that he is God's single solitary king and savior. He possesses all authority and he is the only one able, capable of saving. This is all bound up in those two titles, Lord and Christ. And I know we're, we're, we're fast forward into the end of our passage here for the sake of time, but just notice that this same one who wasn't abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffered decay, that God raised up. He was exalted, verse 33 says, at the right hand of God. He received this promise of the Holy Spirit, and therefore he poured it out. That's what they're experiencing, seeing. David didn't ascend to heaven. He himself even says, the Lord, or Yahweh in the Old Testament, said to my Lord, Adonai, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That's the time that Peter found himself in, that we find ourselves in, where Jesus, the Lord, Adonai, is seated currently at the right hand of Yahweh until a future day. 
when God's enemies are made a footstool for his feet? This, knowing for certain that he is Lord and Christ, I think that one passage, we've already looked at it briefly, but just in Psalm 2, it captures both of these terms. So just turn there. We'll end here. To be Lord, to be Christ. To be Master and Messiah, God's anointed one. This is what Jesus is. God has made him these things. He is just waiting for the full, unbridled, evident manifestation of that reality. And this is what Psalm 2 so clearly, so well has in view. Also written by David. I'm going to read that for us. Why are the nations in an uproar? And the people is devising a vain thing. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. This is God's determination. I will surely tell of the decree of Yahweh. This is, again, the king speaking. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. What do you think about when you hear that word of coming judgment? That he will speak to them in his anger, terrify them in his fury, that he will break them with a rod of iron and shatter them like earthenware. This ought to put the fear of God in us. Where will you run when the day of the Lord comes? When God finally has his day, does away with the wicked of the earth, and brings unhinged wrath upon the earth, where will you flee? There is nowhere to flee except one place. This tells us those who would show discernment, verse 10, who would take warning, We'll do this. Verse 11, worship Yahweh with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the son that he be not angry or when he becomes angry and you perish in the way for his wrath will soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. The curse is coming. The wrath is coming. One safe refuge for all who would escape that coming wrath. Where is it? The blessing is found only in him, in God's king, in Jesus. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Have you done that? Have you taken refuge in Christ? Do you take refuge in Christ? From God's coming wrath, from every other potential danger, do you find safe place in the sun? One commentator wisely said, there is no refuge from him. There is only refuge in him. Take refuge in Christ. He is a faithful Savior, and he lives today for all of those who would take refuge in him to make intercession for them. Let me pray. God, thank you for these truths, what you spoke so long ago in your word as proof of your power.
so definitively demonstrated in the resurrection. And we have today an advocate who ever lives to make intercession for those who trust him. He will never taste death again. He has an indestructible life. He will always be priest, a priest on behalf of those who flee to him. And so I pray for any hearing me preach your word that does not yet trust Christ. Whatever vanities up to now that they have found worth hanging on to, to not bow the knee to Christ, God, disabuse them of that delusion that there could be anything worth hanging on to at the expense of their own souls. And those of us who know you, God, make us faithful witnesses as we saw Peter and the apostles in this passage, God. Make us faithful witnesses who are eager to run with this gospel, with this good news, into the lives of all who do not know you. Even those of us who do know you, make us use this gospel. Let the gospel be on our lips so that you might receive all the glory through the salvation of your sheep. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.